Our scripture for today is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he may have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. As we continue in our series, What Christians Believe, we're going to begin to look at Jesus today. Jesus, God in human flesh. I don't know if you remember the old commercial. Oh, it's been probably 15 or 20 years ago. It said, when you want to get somebody's attention, whisper. (laughs) So maybe I'll get your attention this morning. And you know, when the kids were younger, well, well, actually, I didn't hear about it until they got, they got older. They said, you know, Dad, what you really used to get us? They said it was when you talked real quiet. Because then I knew you weren't mad. You were serious. And so this morning, I'm not mad. I'm serious. <laughs> when we talk about the truth about Jesus. And, you know, we, I'm kind of following the creed, the Apostles' Creed, which... You know, through the years, there's been a few changes, more because our language changed. No content has ever changed. From the earliest of times, these are the core things that have been believed. And yet, often, we don't even talk about them. And I think it's really important that we do. You know, as I reconnect with these things, they're things that we sort of take for granted, but they're things that are also are being eroded away. Um, <clears throat> The first thing to look at is, and this is number one in your notes, the virgin birth, where God took on our humanity. And you know, this has become almost like a litmus test for people's faith. You know, there are those in the denomination that we left that didn't even believe this. And this is kind of the dividing line and essentially, it's, it comes down to, do we believe in the supernatural or not? Because we know in the natural alone, virgins don't get pregnant, right? I mean, <laughs> that's not too hard to figure out. <clears throat> and yet, God did something in the virgin birth that's completely miraculous and wonderful and incredible. So... Is this difficult to believe? And I've heard people say, well, you know, you can't prove that. It's not scientific. Well, there's a lot of things that you can't prove scientifically. But a couple reasons why I believe we should believe it. We have the prophecy prophecy of Isaiah 7. He said it was going to happen. The virgin will conceive. There is verifiable history around the time of his birth that the Magi came, the shepherds came. Outside sources tell us of Herod's killing of the infant boys, two and under. So he wouldn't have done that if there wouldn't have been something special about Jesus. And it fits into the larger history. You know, no matter what happens, history is still divided. It used to be B.C. and A.D., right? Before Christ and Anno Domini. 
Now, if it's, it's been changed to be technically correct, you're supposed to be BCE, before the Common Era, or uh, ACE, after the Common Era, because they don't want to talk about Jesus in there. But regardless, that's where we divide history. So obviously, all of the people at the time saw that there was something special about Jesus. And Scripture tells us, and that's another thing that it really comes down to, is do you believe the Scripture or not? Yeah, it might, it might be hard to comprehend, and yet Scripture tells us, and if we, if we want to start compromising on one place, as some have done, they've tried to save Christianity from some of the things like Jonah and the whale and the virgin birth and some of the things that are a little hard for people to take, but it comes down to the fact if we believe that in a God who created everything that exists, is it too much of a stretch to believe that he can do this? He can do anything. Um, and I want to look a little bit, and I think this is significant because, you know, probably none of us will be on a stage debating this. But you're going to be on the stage by the water cooler at work or at the lunch table or with your neighbor when something comes up and we encounter those things. And I don't know that there's hardly ever an argument that changes anybody's mind, okay? So our job isn't necessarily to change their mind. But I at least want to as your pastor, Phil, I want to equip you so you can stand firm and your faith isn't shaken by the fact they say, well, that, you know, that's not scientific. I don't want you to be left stranded saying, well, am I believing something that's kind of crazy? No, I'm believing something that's supernatural, but you can't prove it scientifically. Of course you can't. How would you go about proving that or a lot of other things scientifically? You can't really prove anything that's historical scientifically. It was only recently that we've been able to determine paternity for people who are alive through DNA. That's only recent. So there's no way we're going to go back and, you know, it'd be interesting to look at Jesus' DNA, but we can't do that. <laughs> you know, we can't verify that scientifically. But you know what? You can't verify the paternity of Alexander the Great or Napoleon or the kings of England or anything like that either. You have to believe the historical record. And that's what we're doing with Jesus. And it is a very reasonable belief that the God who created the universe and who loves us so much that he took on human flesh would be born of a virgin. It fits into the big picture of what we believe. And we do have this tradition from the earliest of times. Jesus' brothers and sisters believed it, but ultimately it does come down to our own belief in the supernatural and in miracles. Is God able to do things like this? Second, we want to look at Jesus and see that he was fully human. He was fully human. When he was born, he took on all the attributes of humanity. He got hungry. He laughed and he cried. He felt pain. He got tired. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says that he can empathize with our weaknesses because he was tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. So no matter what you're going through, Jesus went through it in some way. He understands. And he got through it without giving in and without sin. So he was fully human. 
If he was any less than fully human, he couldn't have paid the price for our sins. Number three, he was fully God. Verse 15 here, the son is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. And that that word firstborn means basically the leader over all creation, not necessarily physical birth. The firstborn, just it's a position. For in him all things were created. So Jesus was there at creation. All things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities or all things have been, been created through him and for him. You know, remember that when you get to the point where there's a struggle. We're going to pause a minute. Let's pray for Virginia as, as they take, go ahead and continue to care for her. Father God, we bring Virginia before you. We ask that you would touch her and give her your grace. Give her your strength, Lord. Lord, whatever's what, whatever is wrong, we ask God that you would touch her this very moment. In Jesus' name, amen. So number three, as we're looking, that Jesus is fully God. He's the image of the invisible God. And I want to encourage you to read this passage sometime. As you read it and let it soak in, it's pretty incredible. He's the ruler over all creation. And sometimes when we, when we look and we see some of the political things going on and the powers that go on, and we think, wow, this is scary. This country could nuke us or that country could fall apart or our own country could be in some kind of horrible danger. We have to remember that Jesus is still ruler over all creation. There's still nothing that can happen that he doesn't somehow allow. Now, he has, he's told us that things are going to go from bad to worse. He's told us that some of these evil things are coming, so they're not catching him by surprise. But regardless, he is still in control. And I think that's so good to remember because... I can only watch about so much of the news until I start to get frustrated. But Jesus is above all of that. <clears throat> he created everything. He is before all things, historically. And in him, all things hold together. This is an interesting verse. This is in verse 17. I had a physics professor and we were talking about the atom and about protons and neutrons and electrons and the charges and all that kind of stuff. And I remember a little bit of that. <laughs> but he said, you know, if you look at the atom, we haven't yet figured out what holds it together, why it stays together. He said the closest thing that they can find to call that is they call it a binding force that holds the atom together. He says, but I know what it is. I know what it is. 
And he looked at this verse and he said, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He said, it's Jesus that's holding every atom together. In that moment when he stops holding it together, it's all going to burn. The fusion and the heat will be truly biblically apocalyptic. We hear that word so many times. Everything's apocalyptic anymore, isn't it? You know, but truly, Jesus holds everything together from every atom in, in all of creation. And you know what? If he can hold every atom together in all creation, he can hold things together for me and you, can he? He can hold families together. He can hold our hearts and our emotions together when they feel like they want to fall apart or explode. He has things in control. For in him all things hold together. Verse 18, and up until Easter, we're going to be looking at Jesus, different aspects of Jesus. <clears throat> and there's always going to be a little overlap. So he was the firstborn from among the dead. Firstborn, the resurrection. Death couldn't keep him down because he was still in control. He willingly laid down his life. You know, when he stood before Pilate, then they asked him, essentially, if he was the king of the Jews, if he was God, he could have got off if he would have kind of copped a plea and said, well, yeah, I'll, I'll admit that I'm not, just to avoid the cross. But he is the way and the truth and the life, and so he told the truth. It is as you say. And it cost him the crucifixion, which was his mission to pay the price for your sins and my sins. But death couldn't keep him down. So he was the firstborn among the dead. In everything, he has the supremacy, verse 18 says. Everything, he might have the supremacy. And verse 19 says, God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. Jesus is not kind of like subsequent to God the Father. He is, has all the fullness of God came down on earth and walked among us. Now, reasons to believe this. Because again, this, this sometimes gets questioned. You know, I, I run into people who have a lot of uh, agnostic beliefs and stuff like that. There, isn't, there aren't too many, too many days and definitely not too many weeks I don't encounter a couple agnostics who are making fun of their wife's belief in God or their husband's belief in God or even their kids or their, their parents or somebody because they're smarter and they know better and they have these arguments that kind of sound pretty good. And yet, as we look at scripture, we never, never need to be afraid of the truth because it always bears out Jesus Christ. There's actually a book out, I haven't read it, um, but it says, I, I'm interested in it. It says, the title is, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. There's more missing pieces if you want to be an atheist than there is if you want to be a Christian. It takes faith to believe in Jesus, but there's a lot of missing links and a lot of missing pieces in evolution. Sadly, it's been considered the only thing that's allowed to be taught in our schools. It's, it's got the government backing, essentially. And the time's coming where we're looked at, and I've even heard it a couple times, as religious bigots if we only believe Jesus is the, the way. Now, I don't think to believe Jesus is the way makes anybody a bigot. I think it's just truthful. And we can love all people. 
No matter what, we should. Jesus did. But it doesn't mean that they're all right. You know? Either Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, or he's not. So some reasons to believe Jesus was fully God and is fully God. He is so much more than just a prophet or a special person. Because history verifies that he was here. You know, you, you can't get past that. But he was much more than just another good prophet. Scripture overwhelmingly supports it. So scripturally, there's not a question at all. This might sound odd, but Jesus believed it. Jesus believed that he was truly God. Now, he laid down some of those powers. He chose not to use them when he walked among us. His miracles testified of it. As Bonnie talked this morning, you know, who can do miracles? Jesus. And you and I can do miracles as his body, but he's doing it, right? We're just the avenue. Every Christian can pray and expect a miracle because that's the way God works. But his miracles testified of it. The proof was in the things that he did. He died because of it, and he was resurrected because of it. And the resurrection, you know, if you, if you kill somebody and you can't keep them dead, that tells you something. And we'll look at the resurrection more in the future, but the resurrection would stand up today in any court of law. There's so much evidence, so much evidence. And it has, this has been historically believed since Jesus walked the earth, that he truly was God in the flesh. He's fully God. Now, I know our minds have difficulty realizing that one person at the same time is fully human and fully God. But that's true, and that's Jesus. And that's what makes his coming to walk among us so incredible. He was the perfect sacrifice because he walked among us. He didn't die for his own sins because he never sinned. He died for ours. Now, number four, he's head of the church. He's head of the church, his body. And you know what? There's always something supernatural about the church. Even if you look through history, there's always that thread. And you look, because Christianity's had some hard times. Christianity's got it wrong and got off track. But there was always some place where people got it right and kept it right and followed Jesus. Jesus is the head of the church. And when we meet, you know, this is so much more than a civil organization. You know, we seem to like each other as people in this church. That's, that's a wonderful thing. We have good fellowship. But I hope you're not coming just to see each other. You know, I hope you're coming to meet with Jesus. Because when God's people gather, something supernatural happens. I know at even times that, that in my life that I was struggling and going through some tough things, you know, I would drag myself to church because Jesus is there. You can't substitute anything for the body of Christ. Nobody else has it. You can't get it from watching, you know, TV preachers. You can't get it from, and, and I'm not saying it's necessarily wrong to look at messages and find other ways to find information, but there's something incredible when we gather in his name. He's here among us. There's something, and in every church, every Bible-believing, Jesus-loving church, this is true. So all over this nation this morning, Jesus is showing up when we gather. And that's so important. He's head of the church, his body. 
And you know, that means we're his hands and his feet. If people are going to see Jesus, they're going to see it through you and me. They're going to see it through the way we teach each other or we treat each other. They're going to see it through, honestly, the way that we suffer. How do you handle struggles? How do you help them when they're handling struggles? People are going to see Jesus live in us and through us. That should be our prayer every day. The Lord use me. Live in me and through me. You know? Because you have access to people that nobody else does. So he's the head of his body, the church, and we're the hands and the feet. And number five, he came to reconcile. Verse 19. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. A couple weeks ago, we talked about what happened at the fall when Adam and Eve sinned, how everything got ruined. And I think it's really important to understand how bad and how much effect that had so that when we realize Jesus came to reconcile things, we realize what, what kind of a mess it is that he's working on cleaning up. So Jesus came to reconcile. First of all, all things to himself. He, made, he came to make things right again. And he's still doing that. He came to make peace through his blood shed on the cross. But you know, reconciling is what he's about. He wants to bring people back to God. He wants to renew that relationship. If you've never had a relationship with God, he wants to have one with you. If you've have, had one and it fades, and it's, he wants to reconcile you. And every day when we mess up, or we sin, or we just sort of forget about him for a minute, whatever it is, he wants to reconcile us back to him. And he also wants to reconcile us to each other. You know, we're not always easy to get along with as people, are we? But you know, Jesus is in the business of reconciling. And so don't be afraid to pray that he could do the impossible in reconciling situations, friendships, families. That's what he's about. That's what he wants to do. And we already know that that's his will. He came to reconcile the world to himself, but in the process to each other. And he came to make peace. So this morning I want to ask you, is there anything in your life where you need a, you need a reconciliation from Jesus? You need him to fix it. If so, go to him and make that an item of prayer. Ask him. Be bold enough to trust that if he's the son of God, he can do it. He can do it. He can break down those barriers between people. And if you feel far away from him this morning, he wants you to be close. He wants to reconcile you to him. He wants to put his loving arms around you and hold you close and let you know that he loves you and let you know that it's going to be okay. No matter what's going on, he's there. Nothing catches him by surprise. And he's got the power and the ability to carry you through whatever it is and to glorify himself in that process. Pray with me as we close. Uh, Lord God, we, we thank you for Jesus. Lord, we're truly amazed at what you've done for us and Lord, we ask that you would reconcile us. Lord, show us things that keep us away from you. And Lord, show us how beautiful it is to be close to you and be in your loving arms. Lord, we, we pray for Virginia right now, Lord. We don't know what's really going on, but we ask God that you would touch her right now in the name of Jesus and strengthen her and empower her. 
Build her up in you, we ask. For your glory, in Jesus' name, amen.